Coming up on Tech News Today, why Microsoft bought Nokia and what's left of Nokia after they bought that big piece of it. Also, Verizon bought itself. We'll explain the implications of that. And Acer touting its first 4K phone. All that and more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Tuesday, September 3rd, 2013. Tech News Today is brought to you by GoToMeeting with HD Faces by Citrix, the powerfully simple way to meet and collaborate with coworkers and clients from anywhere. You can share the same screen and see each other face to face with HD video conferencing, even from an iPad. Sign up for your 30 day free trial today. Visit gotomeeting.com, click on the Try It Free button, and use promo code TNT. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Aya Zakhtar. And I'm Jason Howell. And this is the show where we help keep you up to date on all the great August news that breaks over Labor Day weekend. It spills into September. We got some great stuff. Mary Jo Foley and Paul Thorat are going to join us to talk about the Windows Nokia or the Microsoft Nokia thing. Gina Trapani is going to be with us to talk about stuff today. But let's start with the top 10 stories of the day in the news feeds. Microsoft announced it will acquire Nokia's Devices and Services Unit for $7.2 billion U.S. Microsoft anticipates regulatory approval for the deal to close sometime in the first quarter of 2014. Nokia CEO Stephen Elop has stepped down to become executive vice president of Nokia's Devices and Services Company and will make the move with the unit to Microsoft. He is considered now to be one of the front runners to replace outgoing Microsoft CEO Steve Ballmer. Microsoft will get a 10-year license to Nokia's patents and the brand names Lumia. Lumia and Asha, along with the unit. Nokia will be led by interim CEO Risto Silasma and continue with NSN, its mobile broadband network equipment division, here, its mapping technologies division, and advanced technologies, which combines R&D and patents together. But who really cares about Nokia That's and Microsoft right. when we find out that Verizon Wireless is now fully owned by Verizon? Yes, British cellular company Vodafone has sold its 45% stake of Verizon Wireless back to Verizon for $130 billion in cash and stock. Vodafone bought its piece of Verizon Wireless for $70 billion over 10 years ago. The purchase is expected to close by the end of Q1 2014, pending regulatory approval. Amazon announced a new service called Kindle Matchbook that will offer buyers of physical books Kindle editions at a steep discount. Prices range from free to $3, and you'll be able to get that price on new books you bought from Amazon dating back to 1995. Amazon also accidentally announced its next Kindle Paperwhite by posting the product page for the new device, then pulling it, then putting it back up. The new Kindle Paperwhite is up for pre-order. The device will cost between $119 and $189, depending on the model you buy. The new Kindle Paperwhite has a new display technology that should have better contrast and an improved light source. It's going to launch on September 30th. Spotify has a new feature called Spotify Connect that stores information about your listening sessions remotely, making them device independent. For instance, you could switch your music listening from your phone to Spotify Connect compatible speakers without stopping playback. Spotify Connect will not work on the free account, though. You'll need to fork out some cash for a premium account if you want to use it. Good news for sports fans. The upcoming Xbox One will feature improved applications for both ESPN and the NFL. The new ESPN app is designed to provide a personalized experience highlighting content that's relevant to a user like a specific sports league or teams to follow and clips and highlights and news shown when they log in. The new NFL app will focus on news and video as well, plus access to NFL network content and the NFL Red Zone. Ooh, Red Zone. Ahead of IFA, Acer announced a couple of new devices. First up is the Acer Liquid S2 6-inch smartphone, and Acer says it's the first smartphone they can record 4K video. The Liquid S2 will also have 16 gigabytes of storage, with the option to expand that up to 128 gigabytes. If a 6-inch device is just too darn small for you, Acer also announced the Iconia A3 10.1-inch tablet. It's running Android 4.2, has plenty of ports, including a micro HDMI port if you want to attach that tablet to a monitor or a television. The A3 also packs in Dolby Digital Plus for virtualized 5.1 audio out of a tablet. 
We're getting a lot of announcements in front of IFA in Berlin. Uh, Lenovo announced a refresh to its Ultrabook line, along with new Haswell-based T440 and T440S from $1,149. Comes the X240 from $1,099, and all of those will be available in October. The mid-range S440 and S540, the company's first 15-inch Ultrabook aimed at business, will be available in Germany later this month. Microsoft has stated in the past that users will be able to expand the Xbox One's internal 500 gigabyte hard drive with an external USB storage, but not at launch. Xbox Community Manager Larry Major Nelson Herb said that while the external storage feature is being worked on, quote, my understanding is that the feature will not be there at launch because the team's working on other things. It's definitely on the list. I don't know when, when, when it'll come in, though. Yeah, well. Errol Kumar says he was paid $12,500 by Facebook as part of their bug bounty program. Kumar found a bug in Facebook's support dashboard, which allowed a user to delete any photo on Facebook, no matter who owned it. Facebook pays a minimum of $500 per bug and then increases the amount based on the severity. So they must have thought that was pretty severe. Google's Sundar Pichai has confirmed that the next version of Android will not be called Key Lime Pie, but it will be named KitKat. KitKat is the code name for Android 4.4 and not Android 5.0. There's now a giant KitKat-based Android mascot on the Google campus. Google says, quote, it's our goal with Android KitKat to make an amazing Android experience available for everybody. Yay. Amazing. <laughs> Chocolate. They must have had to do a licensing deal or something. With it. Uh, this episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by GoToMeeting with HD Faces by Citrix. Meetings are essential to the way we work. It's an opportunity to share your ideas, to problem solve, develop creative solutions. But if your team is spread out in different locations like ours is, coming together can be almost impossible. But it's not impossible if you use GoToMeeting with HD Faces by Citrix. It's the powerfully simple way to meet and collaborate online. We use it to do planning meetings because our advertising uh, clients are in one part of the country. We're in another part of the country. In fact, staff members are traveling. They're all over the place. And it allows us to get together and talk about things and make sure you see that somebody's understanding you. It's not just about seeing the faces. That's cool and all. But it's about seeing that, that nonverbal reaction, the nodding of the head, the look on the face of understanding. That's key to making sure a meeting goes well. So no matter where everyone is located, go to meeting let you share the same screen, you can demo your product, make it easier to be on the same page, and you turn on your webcam, you can see other faces in HD video. So it's really easy to launch, it's, it's like, well, wait a minute, I don't know if this is going to work. No, you, you join a meeting from anywhere, you can use your computer, you can use your phone, you can use your tablet, you can even present from your iPad. Try GoToMeeting free for 30 days. For this special offer, visit GoToMeeting.com, click the Try It Free button, and use the promo code TNT. Remember, use that promo code TNT. Go to meeting. Meeting is believing. And we thank Citrix for their support of Tech News Today. All right, we're going to get to the amazing Gina Trapani in a minute. But uh, we had a little special report right before we went live with Tech News Today with Paul Therott from winsupersite.com and Mary Jo Foley from allaboutmicrosoft.com. Of course, hosts of Windows Weekly right here on Twit as well. The big news, of course, Nokia being sell, sold in part, the, the devices and services division, uh, to Microsoft. And uh, as we mentioned in the news fuse, Microsoft is getting a 10-year non-exclusive license to its patents, to, to Nokia's patents. Microsoft will grant Nokia reciprocal rights to use its location-based patents. Microsoft gets a four-year license to here. Uh, but most of all, they get the majority of that devices and services unit, the manufacturing arms, the plants, the factories, most of the designers, we'll talk about that in a second, and the Lumia and Asha brands. And Nokia will allow Microsoft to use the Nokia name on the feature phones for a couple of years, uh, but Nokia will not be allowed to use the Nokia name on their own mobile devices until 2016, December 31st, 2015, is when that goes into place. So Mary Jo, right before uh, we started, you mentioned that one of the Nokia designers has already announced they're leaving. Yeah, I just saw this news. It's on uh, WP Central, actually. They, um, how do you pronounce this guy's name? Here's the question. <laughs> Marco <Yep. laughs> Atasari, I believe. Good call. Uh, I'll, I'll right? buy it. Yeah. Uh, this is Nokia's top designer, and he just announced he's leaving Nokia uh, this November. Uh, so that's that's kind of an interesting development, given what, what just happened this weekend. <laughs> 
So 31,999 employees then. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go from Nokia to Microsoft, including Stephen Elop, who is stepping down as CEO and becoming the head of that division. Uh, I, I thought it was interesting. Julie Larson Green, who is in charge of the devices and studios division, uh, apparently will be reporting to Elop. Paul, we talked about this a little in the special report, but where did, well, how does this affect Elop's candidacy for the CEO position replacing Steve Ballmer? So I don't, I don't think it affects that. I, I think there's still a you know, 50-50 chance or whatever it is for Elop to move into that position. And I have to think that he's a serious candidate for the job. I mean, I think opinions differ about whether he is qualified for that or the right guy for that or, you know, will become the CEO. But I, I don't think that his taking that position as uh, the person in charge of devices, and I'm sorry, in charge of devices um, impacts that at all. The big question I think everybody has is, why does Microsoft do this? $7.2 billion is less than Nokia paid for Navtech in, what, 2007 when they sure. acquired that. And they're holding on to the mapping technology. Nokia is going to keep that part of it. What does Microsoft get out of this? Yeah, a lot, well, a lot of people have been asking me, why didn't Microsoft actually buy out the HERE technology? Because they could really use that mapping technology um, especially in conjunction with their own Bing Maps and, and Bing Search. I, I'm guessing Nokia didn't want to sell that. They thought they could, you know, keep keep the other part of the company in business by licensing that out instead. I, I would totally guess that Microsoft um, made a bid to try to buy that outright, but they did not get it. And, and you know, search, the whole geospatial and search technologies, there's a very nice dovetailing there, but Microsoft is at least going to be... Um, able to modify the HERE technology, they said. It's not an exclusive deal, but they'll be able to make changes um, to that core technology and then use that across their own devices, not just phones, but also PCs, tablets, uh, probably the Xbox um, in some way. So it, that's going to be a pretty interesting thing to watch where, where HERE goes now. Paul, what do you think? Yeah, I think it's absolutely uh, the case that Microsoft wanted here, would have benefited greatly from owning that, and that Nokia did a little bit of math on each one of their various properties and did the right thing for themselves financially, which makes perfect sense. And in the case of here, uh, that meant keeping it and licensing it. You know, and we talked earlier on the on the special show that, you know, the, the Nokia that moves forward from 2014 on is a much smaller and very different company than the Nokia we've known in the past. And you know, when you when you make those comparisons with like Navtech from years ago, I mean, that version of Nokia was a much bigger company that had no idea, you know, that the future was coming in the way that it did. I mean, things change. And so uh, Microsoft buying Nokia for less than it's spent on Skype is kind of amazing too. When you think about it, Skype sold for eight point five million dollars, uh, eight point five eight point five billion dollars. Five billion dollars, uh, yeah. Yeah, as compared to, say, 7.2 for what they're paying for Nokia. I, I wonder if the writing wasn't on the wall. As, as much as Windows Phone has been growing, uh, that <clears throat> this was not going to work. With and, and in fact, Nokia's interim CEO, Risto Sil Silasma, talk about having a, a good name to pronounce. I apologize, Mr. Silasma, about what I've just done to your name. Uh, he said, Nokia alone does not have the resources to fund the required acceleration across mobile phones and smartphones, especially as we have yeah. great opportunities in our other businesses as well. I thought that was an honest and semi-startling admission. Um, although he's been pretty humble, I guess, his whole time at Nokia. He often talks about the challenges, and he did give that on very honest assessment about Nokia's prospects uh, You know, within that first year of his tenure as CEO there. Um, but yeah, certainly, uh, Microsoft is a a company of a vastly bigger size has much more in the way of resources, financial and otherwise, than Nokia. And um, I, I think that the the math finally caught up to them as an independent entity as far as smartphones, where they were seeing a lot of improvement, but were never really making major headway against the competition and weren't making money per each handheld sold, you know, which uh, you can only run like that for so long. Microsoft. Oh, go ahead, Mary Jo. Uh, no, I, that wasn't me. Somebody that was else me. was speaking. 
<laughs> okay, oh, I'm, Mary you, I'm gonna interrupt. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, yeah, so I'm I'm still confused by why why Microsoft won the Nokia brand at all. I know they have a lot of the IP rights when it comes to the branding. Isn't like the Xbox brand way stronger for a phone, even the Surface at this point, because they're somewhat relatively unknown. Nokia is bringing what with it for Microsoft? Because if Microsoft just wanted to buy or have deals for factories and such, I mean they bought like Danger a long time ago. They can have different deals for different uh, factories. Why I just I can't figure out why Nokia, other than the fact that they've had a long-standing relationship, why they thought this would be the best way to go, as opposed to either striking out on their own. Seven point what was it, seven point two billion dollars. It's it's it seems like they could have invested that differently. Well, you know, uh, uh, well one thing you got to remember about Nokia. Use, though, go ahead. Go ahead, Paul. No, I was just going to say, you know, in the United States, Nokia doesn't have a big brand, but internationally, they're humongous. And um, even though Windows Phone is not doing particularly well in China, I think that the Nokia brand is important for uh, huge emerging markets like that, but also established markets around the world, not just uh, countries in Europe, but also in Asia, in Africa, South America, and elsewhere. And I think that that is, that is why, you know, that even though we might not perceive it to be a valuable brand here in the United States, I think that it is a very valuable brand elsewhere and uh you know windows phone could succeed very well and never achieve decent market share into the biggest and most important uh markets on earth china and the united states um and you know we'd wonder why do why do these people in other countries use this thing i mean i you know it's kind of hard to understand when we don't live there i don't you know i don't understand it myself i just know that to be the case yeah, I think I think you also can make the argument, which Microsoft officials made on the conference call explaining this, that they were starting to become fearful that they were going to be locked out by Apple uh, on one end and Google on the other end. So they they made the point today when they were talking to Wall Street that we are worried that Apple and or Google could somehow lock us out through through you know changing protocols through. Um, not allowing their apps to work on our devices, which is something we're seeing Google definitely do with Windows Phone, trying to do at least, trying to put a squeeze on Microsoft. So they made the case, we need to own this end to end so that we can make a comparable ecosystem to what Apple and and uh, Google are building for their phones and their developers. So they, yeah. I think that's also part of this whole equation. They, they were thinking, okay, we can have them be our partner, but we're still gonna risk it that they're not actually part of Microsoft. Um, it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting yeah. argument. You remember Apple kept uh, SkyDrive from being updated on iOS for nine months or so last year. Right. Yeah. Uh, this past year. Um, but they had really good Microsoft reasons. Microsoft is suspected, or it's suspected that Microsoft is paying Apple 30% of every new Office 365 signup that occurs over I iOS because there was no other way to get that software on those devices. And Apple uh, could arbitrarily uh, prevent them from, you know, getting their software out on these devices, as could Google. And certainly, uh, you know, when you combine that with the stuff that Mary Jo just talked about, that's already happened. I mean, it, if God help us, if Microsoft is actually successful, um, these things might never appear on iOS or Android because of, you know, competitive reasons. Now, I think, I think we've covered some really good reasons. You can see some really good reasons why Microsoft would want to have the handset business from Nokia. Uh, they've said, we're, we're going to make $40 per handset now instead of the $10 we were making previously. But what does Nokia have left? Uh, they have the here mapping technology. They have NSN, which is the old Nokia Siemens network that was brought back into Nokia. That's their mobile broadband network infrastructure, things like LTE, and they're working on 5G. They have advanced technologies. Uh, that's their R&D group and all of their intellectual property, connectivity, sensing, materials, web, cloud technologies, 56,000 employees, 13 to 14 billion euros in annual revenue. And Paul, you mentioned in, 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 our, uh, in our special about this, it doesn't seem to be as important as the part that they lost. I mean, they yep. will get the chance to make handsets again in 2016 when that licensing agreement ends with Microsoft. But do you think that in, in a sense, this is Nokia claiming Nokia back? and saying, you know, we had to change everything with the handsets because it was failing. We used to be a tire company. We used uh, to be a galoshes uh, company. Now we're just going to be an enterprise company. You know, what What was it that Nintendo used to do? Didn't they used to make little uh, wooden toys or something? Yeah. It, you know, it's it, it's Playing like them cards, announcing right. we're going to go back to card games or something, you know? Uh, yeah. I, I think that that history of Nokia is such a foreign thing to almost everybody, even people that follow the company, that it's just a little strange. I mean, it's... Um, it's almost like a giant software company saying that they were a devices and services company. It doesn't make any sense. <laughs>
<laughs> Where did that come from? Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, Mary Jo, what do you think? What do you what do you think of the future of Nokia? What's left? Yeah, I think you know, you know what I think is interesting, and this is what we don't know is how much of this did Microsoft want to buy, and how much of this, how much of the company did Nokia actually want to sell? Right? We talked about here already. I, I think Nokia actually wanted to hold on to that because they saw that as a way to have some recurring revenue by by having, uh, by being able to license that out. And um, I think I think it'll be interesting to see what other patents they held on to, what they're going to license out, who else is going to license them besides Microsoft. That could be very interesting. Um, but yeah, they they did definitely dump a lot of the stuff that people um, kind of think of when they think of Nokia, right? Um, yep. They they actually sold outright to Microsoft 8,500 design patents. So uh, you know not just licensing that, but as selling that outright, I believe. So yeah, it's it's a very different Nokia, a very different company, and it'll be interesting to see now where where they go next and what kinds of things they do. Will will they do any more phones themselves running a non Windows you know, Phone operating system? <clears throat> uh, this reminds me of uh, IBM when they left the PC business. And I, I remember thinking at the time that up until that time, of course, they were a very central part of the conversation that we would have around personal computers for obvious reasons. And once they sold that PC business, they sort of had Lotus Smart Suite and they were doing some stuff around services. Um, and they became kind of a bit player. But of course, that stuff just kind of faded. And now they're not part of this conversation anymore. And I have to kind of think that that's how Nokia is going to go, that they'll have the here mapping services. Um, and that will be interesting on the side. They'll make their deals with automakers and we'll see those things appear on Windows devices. And so you and I can talk about that kind of stuff. But by and large, they become not part of the conversation. It was last year that Nokia said something like on a, on a call saying they want to become the wear company. Do you remember that? It was like around like July of last year. It seemed like a really odd yeah. thing to say back then. I wonder how long <laughs> they've been planning yeah. to just become about maps and stuff and go to here because they wanted to do wear. So they are aware with here. They're, but they're yeah. going to be they the, the where are they now company yeah. is what they're going to be. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to wrap it up there. Uh, Paul Therott, thank you so much uh, for joining Thanks, us. Winsupersite.com. And, of course, the conversation will continue on Windows Weekly with Paul. Thanks again, man. Thank you. And Mary Jo Foley, uh, allaboutmicrosoft.com. Of course, you can follow her work on ZDNet as well. And you'll be back to talk a lot more about this on Windows Weekly as well, I'm sure. We will. Thank you, Mary Jo. Thank you. You know, the uh, the stock prices of these two companies are interesting to watch. Nokia has bounced up. Microsoft's bounced down on the news. That's interesting. But as I mentioned, if you want more about this, Windows Weekly this Thursday, and of course, uh, Mary Jo, Paul, Ayaz, and Sarah and I all sat down before the show. There's a special up uh, at Twit tv slash specials or will be up soon uh so check that out all right and now the very patient gina trapani joins us <laughs> to talk about the other news of the day thanks for joining us gina thanks so much for having me i'm excited to be here yeah me too uh we're gonna kick it off with with another purchase uh but this one <laughs> verizon buying out the rest of themselves from vodafone sarah yeah of course microsoft and nokia have to take the wind out of my sails best story ever uh you know we we talked about this was sort of long rumored was it on the table was it off the table turns out it is official uh, verizon wireless has bought back vodafone's 45 percent stake in Verizon Wireless, which is its UK, or US rather, a wireless arm, for $130 billion in cash and stock, which just happens to be the third largest corporate deal of all time. So how about that? Vodafone, mm. as I mentioned earlier in the show, had bought a 45% stake of Verizon Wireless, oh, you know, over a decade ago for $70 billion. So, you know, they've almost doubled uh, the... Uh, the, the value of this stake. Lowell McAdam, who's Verizon CEO, says this transaction will enhance value across platforms and allow Verizon to operate more efficiently so we can continue to focus on producing more seamless and integrated products and solutions for our customers, blah, blah, blah. What I think is actually interesting here is Vodafone now has no U.S. presence, whereas before it had quite a bit. Verizon is, 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 is the biggest wireless carrier in the U.S., so... Uh, really uh, lucrative presence, but it does have networks in the UK, across Europe, uh, certain interesting emerging markets like Turkey and India, um, parts of the African continent. So I guess it's sort of like, well, now what? Vodafone 
itself has been on a bit of a tear. Uh, over the last couple of years, it acquired cable and wireless uh, worldwide for $1.6 billion. It acquired the German cable operator Cable Deutschland for $10 billion uh, just uh, back in June of this year. It's building a $1 billion fiber optic network in Spain in partnership with Orange, which is based in France. So what do we think? Now that Vodafone is completely separate from Verizon, what does it do with all the billions that, that Verizon paid to it? Or is it per, perhaps up for its own acquisition? Gina, do you have any thoughts on this? It sounds like they want to be the European carrier. I mean, I, I totally associate Vodafone with like soccer matches, right? Because they always they always uh, advertise in yeah, soccer right. matches. I'm sure I, I've, I've bought SIM cards and I've been traveling abroad that were Vodafone. I, I, it's it's interesting. Like I would love to actually to see Vodafone in some sort of partnership with AT and T, so U.S. customers could get sort of really you know great roaming deals when when we travel abroad, just from a very self interested U.S. centric point of view. Um, yeah, I don't know. I would kind of like to see something happen between Vodafone and AT&T. Otherwise, I just can, you know, sort of wistfully look at the, those Vodafone ads and think, hmm, so much better over there in Europe, <laughs> which is always what I think when it comes to wireless carriers. When it comes to carriers, but their speeds are pretty slow because 4G is not exactly everywhere in Europe. Uh, I, I bet Vodafone is going to put the money in investing in LTE, 4G networks, so that they have a faster uh, network because that's that's something that they're lagging behind in, in Europe compared to us, which is Sometimes unusual to hear that, but yes, I have to think much more 4G infrastructure and maybe even like fleshing out the 3G infrastructure. I wonder, I think Vodafone is probably like, we're done with the U.S. market for now. We're, we're glad to be out of that. We want to focus on Europe. That's what it sounds like, everything they're saying. But remember, AT&T tried to buy T-Mobile USA. That didn't go through. They're making a go of it now on their own. Is there any shot that Vodafone would be interesting in buying T-Mobile from its competitor uh, in, in uh, Deutsche Telekom? I mean, it's, a, it's an attractive possibility if, if they were wanting to get back in the U.S. market. No. It just seems like if they were already in the U.S. market with Verizon, I, I mean, that's it's a pretty good place to be. And to sell 45% of Verizon Wireless, which is a, obviously a nice, nice, nice big chunk of the company, seems like they've got other ideas it, it, yeah, it does seem to right. me that it's like eh, u.s market we could have we could have kept that really strong foothold but we've decided to uh get a bunch of money and be able to uh invest it in other places so i wouldn't be surprised if this just shifts to not just europe but emerging markets and leaves verizon to its own devices and at&t too for that matter yeah and it'll probably yeah, I think I think so too. It'll probably end up being good for Vodafone and Verizon because now Verizon uh, has a little more flexibility with what it can do with its wireless unit, and there's not that confusion anymore that they're actually two totally separate companies because the chunk of it is owned, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, let's talk about an intriguing new feature from Spotify we heard about in the news news that Spotify Connect. Sarah, tell us a little more about this. Okay, so you have more choices beyond AirPlay if you're on an, an iOS device. Over the coming months, we don't have a specific rollout, but it sounds like it'll be rolled out to all users over the coming months. Premium Spotify subscribers. So many of you may be uh, signed up for the free version of Spotify, but you have to be a premium subscriber, have access via mobile, et cetera. Can now use something called Spotify Connect to stream music from a device to a set of compatible speakers, or just one, as long as it's wireless, or at least be able to just switch devices during a song without there being inter any interruption, as long as you're signed in to Spotify on a couple different devices. There's going to be a connect button that you'll see along with your play buttons and your fast forwards. Then you get a list of all compatible wireless speaker options or other devices you can basically send your music to. Now, I got really excited because I thought, oh, cool. So right now, I have a Sonos system at home. So I've got, you know, if I've, I'm playing Spotify on my iPhone, I could then send it to my speakers. But I have to use the Sonos interface, which isn't great. Could I just then use the Spotify interface? But it doesn't look like the, the speakers that I have are partnered up yet. They've got some big partners, Bang & Olufsen, Denon, Marantz, Philips, Pioneer, Yamaha. But uh, it sounds like that, at least at launch, there are certain speakers that will be compatible, not all speakers that has to have some sort of a partnership. Mm -hmm. So it seems like a little bit of a DIY alternative to Sonos. If you've got certain speakers and you say, I really like Spotify, I love the idea of being able to just send it to the speakers 
and being able to circumvent, say, something like AirPlay. But Spotify Connect is only available on iDevices, at least at launch. So it's an AirPlay alternative if, for whatever reason, you don't want to go through Apple TV. But it does seem like it's leaving out a huge section of people that use Spotify. Gina, am I missing something awesome here? Android's on the way, isn't it? Um, and, and yeah, yeah, I agree that it's weird that they launched on just iOS because it seems like the, the big differentiator is that it could be Android or iOS. Um, yeah, I, I mean, this just, this seems like somewhat, you know, this is a feature for someone who's really serious about Spotify. I'm not a huge Spotify user, but yeah, you have to be a premium member. You have to have wireless speakers that are compatible. And it sounds like a lot of speakers are getting compatibility. Um, but what if you have speakers that don't? And, you know, the rest of the features are that it sort of saves where you are on your playlist and lets you continue listening. So if you switch from your iPhone to your iPad, it'll, it, you know, you can keep listening where you left off. And that's just kind of like, eh. I mean, I sort of expect that from a cloud service. I didn't think that was that was such of a such a big deal. It seems like they need to come out with the Android version uh, soon. And I'm sure we're going to going to grouse about this on all about Android later on tonight. I'm looking at this as, as and when Sarah, you mentioned DIY Sono. So we try to do that on know how to have your audio go to every device is kind of a bear if you're not using something like Sonos. I think this this might make it uh, make Spotify Premium make more sense. It's a little easier. Oh, why else would you pay extra money? Oh, not just, you don't get ads, but you also get an iOS app, you get an Android app that works, and then you can actually eventually send that to different speakers. If all of that's managed in the cloud for you, it definitely seems a lot easier to pay a little bit extra money for those compatible speakers as opposed to thinking like, okay, I'm just going to Sonos. This is like $300 for this device, another $300 for that device. I think as a as a, it's a little easier to swallow the price. I think when it's a little subscription cost, as opposed to the very expensive Sonos system. I think it's obvious that Sonos should implement this or partner or, or whatever because it's exactly the kind of thing that they want to do. I mean, I, that like like you said, Sarah, they already have Spotify, so why not make it so that I can just ju you know toss my currently playing playlist over to the Sonos without missing a beat? That would be that'd be fantastic. Yeah, it's it's interesting that. You know, there were some whispers of, oh, Spotify is going to pull support for Sonos, and they're you know, they're basically building a Sonos competitor. And the company did say, to clarify, we don't really have anything to say about it, except that we will continue to have a relationship with Sonos. But yeah, that's one of the weird things about Sonos is that you have to do everything within the Sonos interface. It's almost like its own really bad cable uh, uh, on screen um, DVR type uh, thing. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's not fun to use, but it works really well if you don't want to look at it. But it's like Spotify seems to be building a competitor, but then you're tied to Spotify. And hey, if you're a loyal Spotify person, Gina, I'm kind of with you. I, I think it's a great service, but I, I, I'm not a, a, an everyday Spotify user. That's great, but these things change so rapidly, especially in the whole streaming music space. I would be I would be really reluctant to spend a bunch of money on a fancy wireless speaker that's not going to be able to wirelessly connect to some other service. Yeah. It's definitely a lock-in thing, it feels like. They're trying they're trying to get you to lock in something that that I don't I don't I wouldn't necessarily be willing to go yet. And you know, and, and it not being on Android is also a blocker for me as well. Yet. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I it feels like something that is meant to bring people from the free level to the premium level, but maybe only attractive to people who already value Spotify enough to pay for the premium level. So maybe it has the effect of keeping them there. I don't know. Amazon's got a new program that will make it cheaper for you to get an ebook when you've already got the Dead Tree edition. Yeah, the more I say this name, the weirder it sounds. The Kindle Matchbook is the program that lets you, if you bought a book on Amazon. Uh, hey, I'm a Matchbook Pro. <laughs> Well, no, it's not a matchbook. It's not a MacBook. Sorry, now, now you got me confused. The Kindle Matchbook <laughs> system, service, excuse me. Uh, if you bought a physical book from Amazon, you'll be able to get Kindle editions of those books for a discount, a steep discount. It could be free, a dollar, two dollars, or three dollars. Amazon will let its customers uh, buy Kindle editions that they purchase in print as far back as 1995. That's back when Amazon opened. <laughs> Back when they sold books, they were just a bookstore back then. Uh, this counted uh, Kindle edition prices apply to book purchases made in the future as well. So when you buy books, you'll be able to do this. So far, Amazon has agreements with a couple of major publishers. HarperCollins was the only publisher Amazon was willing to name, and uh, they're going to offer their titles through Matchbook. Amazon hasn't told, this is in the New York Times article, Amazon hasn't told most publishers about Matchbook yet and hope to sign up more to, to get into the program. And the program starts in October. And Russ Grandin, I can't say this guy's name. 
Brandon Deddy, vice president of Kindle Content, predicted there's going to be more than 10,000 books available when Matchbook launches. Gina, do you think Amazon's going to get these people on board for this? Because <laughs> they didn't apparently tell the publishers. <laughs> that is just weird, weird, weird. Um, this is a terrible name. I think it's a good idea. The way that they're managing the relationships with the publishers, very, very strange. Um, yeah, the name is terrible. Like, burn all the books, right? I mean, how do you, don't you just... <laughs> Just imagine, look, you know, to visualize a matchbook. Um, at the same time, like I really, I really like this idea. I feel like this is going to get people who have not bought Kindle books to buy Kindle books if they know that they can have, you know, the hard copy. And people who have bought, you know, the hard copy of, of books from Amazon, which we all have for years and years, to 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 also get the Kindle version. I would absolutely do that if I was on the road. And I knew there was a book back on my shelf that I wanted to look up something in. I would I would buy the Kindle version really, you know, much more much more quickly if it was two dollars than if it's ten bucks. Um, I don't know. I don't know if publishers are going to jump on this how would you feel about this if you're a publisher? i think matchbook I mean will kindle my fire for rereading old <laughs> books that i have purchased in the past rekindle oh your fire <laughs> it's like the morning of bad names i'm not gonna <laughs> <laughs> kind of is. seriously yeah. yeah don't get that kit kat anywhere near that it's gonna melt uh, okay <laughs> no th i mean this is just redo this is doing what they did with the mp3s already they said hey you bought these cds from us we're going to match that. We're going to give you the MP3s in your account. What's interesting is that with this one, they're giving the publishers the option to pay for it. So I obviously had to have had some talk with publishers about that. I got the email today because I, I sell books that I write on Amazon in Kindle Direct. And they said, hey, you can now go into your Kindle Direct interface and set your price. Although most of us who self-publish keep the prices around 99 cents to $2.99. So I guess it's the idea of like, oh, we'll give a free ebook version if somebody bought the print version. I guess that makes sense. Will this get you to buy more actual physical books? Because most of my, I've been shifting towards digital in general, but I like the idea of having a physical book every now and then to have the Kindle edition. I know that when I wanted to buy, uh, I wanted to buy the audio edition of a book I already owned, I had to pay full price. I'm probably more likely to get the physical book for certain books if I want to hang on to that. Do you think we're going to see an uptick of physical book sales? I, yeah, yeah, I think this is going to up both both physical and 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 digital you know ebook sales, right? Because it's because it's it's a really it's a good deal when you think about it. I mean, the ebook sort of becomes a little bit more of an add-on, but yeah, I really miss. I mean, I, I have mostly moved digital myself in the last few years, but I really do. I still have a bookshelf in my office, and I and there are times when I really want to just grab a book off the shelf. You can't, you know, you, digital books. You can't have it signed. You can't, you know, like highlight. I like I like having books that I love sort of around me, and that and this is kind of best of both worlds. I think that I, I would definitely buy more physical books. Um, although if you buy the ebook and then you want to buy the physical book after, you're still going to pay the full price for both, right? This is, you only get yeah. the discount if you purchase the physical book first. That's what it sounds like so far. It's if you buy it, and yeah. you have to buy it new. You can't buy a used book from Amazon and get this kind of deal either. Right. I, I kind of like the idea of, you know, anybody who's, yeah, you've got, you've got, shelves overflowing with books and you don't want to get rid of those books because you probably bought them because you really liked them or thought that you would and besides the fact that i think books just look really nice uh, you know on a bookshelf on a wall wouldn't it be nice to be able to say i'm getting rid of all of this i'm moving everything to my kindle storage and i don't actually lose out at least on the content of the book so i i think for a lot of people this is just a really attractive option to simplify things Oh yeah, definitely. You can purge those books that you are like, I don't really need to have this any around anymore. But if I want to, I for two bucks I can have it on my device and look something up and I won't really miss it. Yeah. All righty then. I uh, maybe it will drive publishing or, or people to buy like first editions. Maybe it will drive the, uh, the the print books because it doesn't go the opposite direction. That's interesting. Although it's not things aren't replayable like with music. So I wonder how many people it, it's gotta be a lower percentage. Let's finish up talking about Acer announcing some new products in advance of IFA. What do they got for us, Ayaz? Yeah, let's, let's focus on the Liquid S2, the six-inch smartphone or phablet, whatever you want to call it, uh, destined for Europe, no U.S. plans right now. This is the uh, device that Acer claims will be the first 4K recording smartphone out there. It's got the camera can take 13 megapixel stills, 4K video, uh, 4X slow-mo in HD, 27 megapixel panoramas, the camera itself is actually surrounded by an LED ring light. Uh, the front camera, though, is also 2 megapixels and can capture 1080p video. The phone's going to make its debut in IFA, which kicks off on September 6th. And it's going to launch in October, like I said, in Europe. No U.S. plans yet, and pricing isn't known. Gina, 4K on a smartphone. The device itself can only display 
1080p video, so if you wanted to look back on it, you couldn't see it. Is this just a gimmick, or is this something amazing? Gimmick. <laughs> I don't. I don't really get it. I don't. I don't really get it. I, I, so 4K is the is the aspect ratio. I'm gonna I'm gonna sound really dumb right now. This means that it's 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 a it's a wider video, right? No, it's four times display. the res four times the it, resolution. Four times the resolution. Okay, so you so you won't see it on the actual device, but this is for playing video on on bigger on bigger screens. Right. Sounds like a gimmick. I mean, it sounds like a like a bet on on video creation. Uh, as a thing that people are doing with their phones, which is a, which is a totally reasonable good bet. I mean, given you know the tools are for that are getting better and better, but I don't know. That's just not going to be that. That's the marquee feature of this phone, and uh, not going to just not going to grab me personally. I mean, I guess if you figure if you're using this phone seriously to take video, and you can throw that to a compatible television that also accepts 4K video, that sounds really attractive. But let's think about how many of us are actually doing that with like 1080p video on our phones right now. I, I mean, it, it, I, I've, I've maybe like sent some phone video to a TV, I don't know, a couple times to show somebody something. But I just don't think that this is a part of our lives enough for this to actually end up selling a lot of units because it's like, besides the fact that we're saying 4K, how much is this really going to be useful in practice? And how good is the video quality, even if it's at 4K resolution? Because I've, exactly. I've tested a few phones in the past that are 1080p, and they say 1080p, and then you record it and play it back. And I mean, I would never have guessed that it was 1080p because it just looks so horrible. Um, and, you know, smartphone cameras haven't given me a lot of faith that what you're going to get out of this is true, pristine 4K video that you're really going to want, like, want to shoot a movie with or something. Like, I doubt it. I mean, it's a good way for Acer to yeah. show that, hey, we're we're actually ahead of the game, right? They they want to have that headline that shows them as being advanced and yeah. people think, oh, Acer, they, they've got those high-quality phones. But it, I don't think in practice it, it sways anyone. It usually doesn't. There, there have even been, you know, portable devices that tout 3D, and 3D is arguably a lot more, uh, you know, found in a lot more living rooms right now than 4K TV is, and they couldn't even oh, do sure. that right, you know, and there was no demand for that even. Uh, so I don't know, a total gimmick. Yeah, Jason, I think your point about how good is the camera sensor? That's really what yes. makes the difference. You can have Absolutely. that resolution of 1920 by 1080 on, a, on an HD video, but that can just be crap if it's compressed like crazy or the sensor's garbage. So in this case, I, I, some people in the chat room were mentioning the idea of digital zoom would be a lot better on 1080p videos, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So there are some cool functions that could be there. Acer, though, is not a name I associate with, like, on the, you know, the bleeding edge of technology. The fact that it's finally small enough to fit into a... I guess small enough to fit into what a six inch device, so maybe it's not that small. Uh, I wonder how long it's going to be before this stuff trickles down to every phone because it used to be that recording full HD, that was pretty rare. Now every phone does that. 4K is just the next gimmick because as TVs keep going, we're going to have the 4K displays. You're going to have to get content somewhere. So it might, might as well come from your shaky phone. Yeah, I fully agree that 4K is definitely something that is going to be important. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's just it's just not important yet, and so maybe this isn't a bad thing for Acer to do. But I, I'm with y'all. It's it's gimmick. That just feels like that now. Anyway, it's to to solve what you just said. I as of I don't associate Acer with bleeding edge exactly. cool stuff. That's why they're doing. They want to they the want to change your mind. Right. They want the bloody edges. Wait. Yeah. Bleed cool, wanna... Acer. Way to bleed. bleed. Cool. <laughs> Let's fire up the randomizer, shall we? Got a really tight straw poll today. At number two right now, man allegedly pawns office computers gets caught. You can read that at CDET. We'll have the link in the show notes. And with one more vote at, at press time, promoted tweet used to complain about British Airways. A uh, businessman named Hassan Syed, fed up with the way British Airways was handling his father's lost luggage problem, decided to buy a promoted tweet and put up there, don't fly at British Airways. Their customer service is horrendous. Uh, as far as we know, this is the first example of someone buying a promoted tweet to advertise a criticism of someone. I wonder how Twitter's partners are like taking to this, by the way. They're like, wait a second. I know Twitter wants to make money, and I know they want to have us pay for promoted tweets. But do they do they have to like out does British Airways have to outbid this guy to make sure this goes away or like how does this how does this even work if you're like Twitter proper? <laughs> I this love seems this like one of those perfect... things that. Go ahead, go ahead Gina. Uh, no, go ahead. 
I was going to say, this seems like one of these things that just has sort of fell through the cracks because promoted tweets are still somewhat in their infancy. I mean, if Twitter and British Airways want to work together in the future in any capacity, they have to make sure that these sorts of things don't end up getting promoted. I, I, I think even if an individual could outbid a company that could possibly have a relationship with Twitter down the road, it's probably not going to happen. I love well, that this is like the perfect uh, manifestation of first world problems. It's like man with lots of money, like it's mistreated by airline. And not only does he complain about it on Twitter, but he prom he pays to have the tweet promoted, p p complaining about it. <laughs> <laughs> and the BBC story estimates he spent uh, less than $1,000, but, but you know, okay, around $1,000. Uh, and British Airways has taken to Twitter to say sorry for the delay in responding. Uh, our Twitter feed is open, 9 to 1700 GMT. Please DM your baggage ref. We'll look into this. So he got their attention anyway. <laughs> he could have bought new baggage for that $1,000. I'm just saying. <laughs> but what about the memories that are in but those they, bags? All they did was at reply when their customer service line is open. He probably didn't need to pay anything. He probably <laughs> would have gotten that reply if he just yeah. tweeted yeah. British Airways. Possibly. That's Kind of what the, you know, a lot of those accounts do is say, we're so sorry you're having a problem. Please call this number. Please stop posting and call us. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's move on and see. We got a couple items, one big one on the calendar. Actually, two big Yeah, really. uh, Samsung's Unpacked 2 event is tomorrow. Uh, Galaxy Note related. TNT is actually going to go live an hour early. Uh, because we want to cover the event live at 10. So anybody who can join us at 9 a.m. Pacific for regular TNT, uh, we'll, uh, we'll, give you, we'll give you more than we usually do on Wednesdays. Yay! Also, Apple has sent out official invites for its iPhone event on Tuesday, September 10th. We will, of course, be covering that live as well as we always do on Twit. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a week of events. All gearing up. This should brighten everyone's day, is the yeah. phrase on the invite for you to overparse as you decide what you think Apple will announce on that day, which will be an iPhone. That or the comes sun. Gold. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or possibly the, the new pastel flat design. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> All right. Well, that, uh, that wraps it up for us today. Uh, Gina Trapani, thank you so much. Are you joining us tomorrow for the, for the Galaxy Gear coverage as well? I I am. I will be there. I'll be on tomorrow as well. I'm doing the the, the marathon of Twit appearances this week. I'll no be on tonight kidding. on All About Android, which I do every every Tuesday night, and then I'll be on tomorrow morning for the the special event, the Samsung event, and then Twig is this week in Google is at one o'clock tomorrow afternoon. So I'm all yours. I'm hey. all Twits this week. Thank you for being so generous with your time. That's amazing. <laughs> of course. Thanks for having me. This is a lot of fun. GinaTrapani.org uh, is the place to go. What do you got going on? Anything else besides being on Twit constantly? To talk about? <laughs> When I'm not on Twit, uh, uh, I'm building a, an app called ThinkUp, ThinkUp.com. You can check it out. It's an open source app. You can download it and install on your own web server if you want to. But I'm also working on launching a hosted web service, kind of like the WordPress.com to WordPress.org. So if you go to ThinkUp.com, you can sign up on the wait list uh, to get first access to that right now. It will hopefully be, hopefully be launching in the next, in next few months, so keep an eye out. ThinkUp.com, you said? Yep. Is where yep. you sign up for the hosted service as well? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yep. I'm in. I'm a big ThinkUp fan. Awesome. Good. Yes. Thank you, Tom. You've been such a good supporter. Absolutely. Well, you you make good things. How could I know? Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Gina. Thank you, folks, for watching or listening. You can go to our subreddit, technewstoday.reddit.com. If you would like to support the show by giving us some information about what you want us to talk about, submit some links, or even more important, vote on the links that are in there. Say, yeah, I want you to talk about that. Vote it up. Yes, that. You can even vote down. Say, no, I don't want you to talk about that. It's all at technewstoday.reddit.com. You can find us on the web at twit.tv slash TNT. You can email us, TNT at twit.tv. And you can give us a call and leave us a voicemail at 260-TNT-SHOW. As Sarah mentioned, we'll be a little earlier live tomorrow, and Aaron Newcomb will be our guest. We'll see you then.